Thank you. And thank you very much to Omnidon for inviting me. This is just a delightful place to be on a delightful afternoon, so I feel like we're getting blessed with the weather, too. And I like being able to find a, a place in a garden to put a glass of water. Okay. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about translation and read some translations um, and some non-translations. Uh, I was interested in this project in part because it's a multiple voice project and throughout the whole thing I was constantly thinking about translation in terms of an exchange of voices and in terms of inhabiting other people's voices, which is in part what translation does. But it, this project was particularly complex in that way because it's kind of a Chinese whispers version of voices or a, a passing on of the voice, a relaying of the voice, so that it involves not only the writer of the quote-unquote original, Jean Fremont, and uh, my voice in the translation, but it also involves Robert Balser's voice and his translator's voice and his translator in English's voice. All are kind of mixed into this project. Uh, Jean Fremont wrote this series of vignettes thinking about Balser's voice and trying to live within him in a certain way. And he ran into the work originally in French. He reads German, but not really fluently, but he ran into it in French, and he loved it instantly and read everything he could find, which at the time wasn't very much, and uh, started this vignette, kind of the series of vignettes, kind of in conversation with him. And um, when I asked him about it, uh, he said, I'm just going to read his little quote. So I read it and immediately fell in love with the tone and the ambience of the book. It was immediately clear to me that it was not a matter of style or manner, but that le style c'est l'homme, the style is the man. You hear the real voice of the author. So I was particularly pleased that he was thinking of it in terms of voice too, and it wasn't just my, um, my impression. Um, so... I was thinking as I translated too, I'm not just translating content, I'm not just translating language, but I'm translating also <coughs> this question of voice that goes back through Jean Fremont's to Robert Valser's, goes back through the English that I'm creating, and goes then back through the French and back through the German, which I don't speak or read. So I found myself nicely at a brick wall there and, and that I couldn't go past and had to kind of rebound off of. I then later ran, I knew Walter also from the French, and it was only after doing this translation project that I ran into Susan Bernofsky's translations of Walter and was just thrilled to find the same voice in them. So. 21. What I love about the villages around here is their setting. It's not exactly mountainous, but nowhere is it flat. For instance, here there's a steep slope down from the church to the square in front of the town hall, so that if you lean over the wall of the church garden, you can see the town hall and watch the people coming and going. The villages around here are like Chinese landscapes. They have high peaks and deep valleys. From where I'm standing, you can catch glimpses between the leaves of the plane trees of the children playing in the schoolyard. Down there in the big square with the butcher and the cafe is the fountain with its four crouching lions spitting out thin streams of water. Farther on, behind the post office, a road lined by pine trees heads down a gentle slope to the village hall next to the soccer field. From there, a short walk takes you to the towpath where you can walk along the river all the way up to the lock. At the very top of the village, at the very edge of the forest, there's a cemetery. I love to walk up there and read the inscriptions on the tombstones with their eternal regrets. How naive and slightly ridiculous they sound when carved in stone. Twenty-six. One of the books in his living room bookcase, few in number and each an object of veneration, the one that R.W. likes best is the big atlas bound in red leather. He opens it on his lap and flips through the pages for hours, his private mode of travel. 
And what he loves above all in the atlas are the lakes. He likes real lakes too, little mountain lakes. There are lots of them around there. R.W. loves to visit them all, to sit on their banks, and even in summer, to slip into their cool waters. He loves the way they reflect the sky and thus enlarge the world. But in atlases, there are many more lakes than there are around there. And in atlases, you can see their shapes, those lovely light blue splashes with strange contours. And what's more, you can see their names. R.W. loves the names of lakes, almost without exception. He writes up lists, Badensee, Wallensee, Zugersee, Dunersee, Biendersee, Unersee, Stilsee, Greffensee, Fackensee. Most of them stretch out lengthwise. Walking around them would be a real journey, easier simply to cut across. Some are very small and almost round. Crossing them would lead nowhere. Sometimes in the evenings, as he's going to sleep, R.W., in a low voice, recites the list of his favorite lakes. Twenty-seven. But the principal value of atlases, dictionaries, and encyclopedias is not in the maps and definitions that they contain, marvelous as these may be. Rather, it's in their considerable weight. It's this trait that allows them to participate participate in the strange operation that consists of carefully crushing the flowers and grasses that R.W. brings back from his walks, drying them for weeks on end between two sheets of newsprint beneath a pile of weighty tomes. It's not that R.W. particularly likes dried flowers, stiff little cadavers rescued from rot. It's not that he'll be touched by their faded colors and frozen poses, their dusty scent. He far prefers seeing them swaying in the breeze catching the light in their colors, emanating a vital perfume. He prefers moving lives to still lives. It's just that, well, drying flowers under a pile of huge books, arranging them in an album, gently gluing them down, and then meticulously recording the name of each one in blue ink beneath, is a calming activity, very calming. And this calm is just what I need, thinks R.W. very much. I'm going to shift and now read some things from Robert Falser himself. Or rather from Susan Bernofsky herself in uh, embodying the voice of Robert Falser. Um, a number of Falser's things um, were written in what are called microscripts. And I invite you to look at the, the um, book afterward, but they're just an amazing, <laughs> amazing way of writing a tiny, tiny thing. And he wrote 500, and they found after his death something like 546, I think it was, of these sheets that were everything from someone's business card that he'd written a whole story on the back of to uh, small sheets of paper like this, but they're all pretty tiny. And often he would fill the entire sheet maybe with three or four or five different compositions and that clearly were written at different times with different inks, etc. And it's they're written in an old German script, an alphabet that German used before it adopted the um, uh, Latin alphabet. So it looks it looks completely illegible, and um, to anybody today it would. And his uh, executor, literary executor, found these this packet of 546 sheets and thought that they were written in a code and that it was undecipherable. And, but he thought they're beautiful, and you'll see when you see the book, it, they're gorgeous. So he had some of them published in a German literary journal, enlarged. And someone wrote to him later and said, they're not indecipherable. This is not a code. This is this ancient script, and it's just German. And here is one translated or transcribed. So um, some people, uh, uh, two people, got together and spent an incredible amount of time transcribing all of the microscripts. And then Susan Bernofsky uh, translated them into English. And I'm just going to read a couple of them. One thing that's interesting is that he often, often they're not complete stories or not complete poems. They were things that he started and left kind of in the middle. Um, he also transcribed many of them 
and sent them to journals and had them published. So they, they weren't all hidden away. Some of them had further lives. But I particularly like the ones that kind of go dot, 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 and go off into the distance. What a nice writer I ran into not long ago. What a nice writer I ran into not long ago. He's been long dead, by the way, for he wrote and lived around the year 1860, and his name will add nothing to this discussion, nor detract from it either, as I am speaking of one of those understandably numerous authors who have been through, <clears throat> been thoroughly consigned to oblivion. The story he, was, story he was telling gripped me from the start. His way of expressing himself pleased me greatly on account of his clarity. He allowed me to peer into the parlor of a woman who was already quietly beginning to approach a certain matronliness, but was nonetheless still beautiful. I was able to picture her quite clearly. In her immediate vicinity lived a young girl. It is perhaps my immaturity. It is perhaps my immaturity, my innocence, or, to put it in a more ordinary way, my foolishness that has prompted me to ask myself whether I would like to enter into relations with you. On account of my total lack of life knowledge, I am called the Blue Page Boy. <laughs> and indeed, I have not yet ever experienced anything worth mentioning, except that now and then, i.e. relatively seldom, I glance into a little mirror. To you who asks me whether I might perhaps at some time or other, such as at nine in the morning, have kissed with my lips a little spoon that a woman had used for the purpose of eating, I reply with, as it were, self-possession, addressing you informally. And this is one that is finished. A will to shake that refined individual. A will to shake that refined individual, to rattle him about as if he were a scraggly tree bearing only isolated jittery leaves, seems to be stirring within me. The wife of the refined and mentally exceedingly proper person one day shouted from their apartment window, Passers-by, down below there in the street, stand by me and come to my aid. Protect me from the inability of my husband, who is a refined individual, not to nonetheless brutalize me in every way. Unquote. O oh, wife of such a husband, and O oh, husband of such a wife, and O oh, you millions of perturbations, you hordes of directors, come this way and display your managerial talents. But let us return to the refined man, whom I can't help imagining standing shivering before me, since, after all, considering what a sizable number of writers there are, all sorts of people living today have grounds to tremble at the prospect of serving as models and being forced, without their knowledge, to kindly provide entertainment. With a gruffness verging on the invidious, I go to work on him. Catch, I say to his horrified face, watching a spectacular iridescent pallor flit across the despondencies my conduct has provoked. I think, he stutters in his horror at finding himself latched onto, that I am relatively well suited to be seized hold of and ruthlessly tested. Do you now, is the reply I give, so you admit it, adding, a discourteous person such as myself is as like as not to box your ears. Tell me, how were you once designated in former days by a splendid woman? She said something very unrefined. And what was this thing it pleased her to utter? She called me a wretch, to which I saw fit to respond that I considered myself a person in some way deserving of such a vehement appellation, and thereupon this excellent creature burst into tears. People who are refined visit other refined people and confide in them, chattering and babbling out precisely what they have experienced and whether they have found the experience indigestible or pleasing. And I'm going to move on to just a couple of brief passages from another book of Valser's called The Walk. And it's also translated by Susan Bernofsky, or more correctly, retranslated by Susan Bernofsky. It has an interesting history. Christopher Middleton translated it in the early 50s. He had, um, it was originally written in 1913, 
first published in 1917, and then for a second publication that came out in 1920, Valser substantially, as, as Fernofsky says, both slightly and substantially uh, changed the text. He didn't change the order of events or the narr narrative that was told, but he made so many tweaks that pretty much every single sentence was changed. So Middleton, when he translated the 1917 version, was unaware that Valser had changed the text later. So what Bernowski did was to go in and just tweak Middleton's translation. She didn't retranslate it. She kept what it was. So she performed the same operation on Middleton's text that Valser had performed on his own. And I was interested in it because um, I'm interested in um, writers who are obsessed with walking. And so um, this is a perfect text of a writer who is obsessed with walking. He walked all the time. The walk. One morning, as the desire to walk came over me, I put my hat on my head, left my writing room, or room of phantoms, and ran down the stairs to hurry out into the street. On the stairs, I encountered a woman who looked like a Spaniard, a Peruvian, or a Creole, and presented to the eye a certain pallid, faded majesty. As far as I remember, I found myself, as I walked into the open, bright, and cheerful street, in a romantically adventurous state of mind, which pleased me. That morning world spread out before my eyes, appearing as beautiful to me as if I saw it for the first time. Everything I saw made upon me a delightful impression of friendliness, goodliness, and youth. It's an incredibly optimistic book. Until it takes a veer into something dark, but that's Walser's kind of approach. Um, this is now midway into the book, midway into the walk. As I went on my way, like a better sort of tramp, a vagabond, pickpocket, idler, or vagrant of a sort finer than some, past all sorts of cont contented gardens planted full with placid vegetables, past flowers and the fragrance of flowers, past fruit trees and past bean shrubs full of beans, past towering delightful crops as rye, barley, and wheat, past a wood cutting yard containing wood and wood shavings, past juicy grass and gently splashing little waterways, rivulets, or streams, past all sorts of people as choice trade-plying market women tripping gently past, and past a festive clubhouse decoratively hung with banners flying for joy, and so many, and also past so many other good-hearted, useful things, past a particularly beautiful little fairy apple tree, and past God knows what else in the way of feasible things. For example, strawberry blossoms, or, even better, gracefully past the ripe red strawberries, while all sorts of thoughts continued to preoccupy me, since, when I'm out walking, many notions, flashes of light, and lightning flashes, quite of their own accord, intrude and interrupt, to be carefully pondered upon. And then there came a man in my direction, an enormity and monster, who almost completely darkened my bright road, a lanky beanpole of a fellow, sinister, whom I knew only too well, a very curious customer, namely the giant Tom Zack. <laughs> One more section. A thunderstorm, I thought as I walked on, would no doubt be magnificent here. I hope I shall have the opportunity to experience it. And I'm going to close with a series of poems that, that um, or serial poem, that I've written on that uh, Robert Walser's walk. And it comes from a manuscript that includes seven serial poems on seven obsessive walker writers. Robert Walser, The Walk. For Valser, a walk usually began by putting on a hat, among a room of ghosts, to the quiet end, if one could walk a lost. For Valser, to walk was to unfold, an origami bird as a door unfolds a world. If there was a child there, the sun spun, and off he walked on that. He knew that a planet, too, wanders, open in a field of asters, and watched the terror vanish falling with the trees into darkness. You walk the dark to recall a specific point in an argument in which you saw something delicate fall apart. 
in fact, to pieces. Valser leaned down to pick something up from the dusty road, and the dust, one by one, Valser thought the form of a road beautiful in itself, citing that its joy exists outside of time, or rather beside it, so Valser walked alongside, along the side of the road, singing under his breath to the grass. He thought a walk could be a masterpiece, which is a matter of arrangement, the elements carefully chosen, a small hand, another stand of trees. Out of the corner of his eye, he saw someone smiling. A walk brings things out, wraps them up in glorious secrets, holds them out at arm's length, and keeps them there, just out of reach, perfecting the scene. Past the gardens he walked, always watching, which sealed the scene into the passing, as what grows in turning is something of the sun. He was on his way to Frau A. B.'s, somewhat detained by the sound of leaves, something left in the shade of green, the deep gray of sheltered light. He saw all things in light of their thoughts. It was a day of flags and grain. Everything good is based therein, he said. Again, to walk again, the very same route turns time into space. A garden is itself a walk that goes beyond itself, is the act of distance lived, composed of senses strayed. He walked across a field that bordered a river that ran alongside the sea, harvesting a studied inability to find his way home. For Valser, walking turned everything he saw into something charmed, a twist of light along a road or through a, stra a stand of trees, a person framed in a doorway and so confused with a voice that unraveled outward in a line not unlike a road lined with houses becoming fewer or a road lined with trees in which strings of light have been strung to trace a path back and then back again walking is always brought Valser to an edge that appeared to live. For instance, in the distance, a railroad running perpendicular, which is in the future, which is in its nature, and so we'll stay there. What is striking in Valser's walk is his evident happiness, the volatile occasion of every glance as a glance that can capture every moving thing simultaneously throughout the drifting trees, the forest of voices that are not heard, the voice as a layering of immediate futures into which we are walking, and suddenly before us a clearing clears, and suddenly before us is an inn, the difference the light makes is striking, striking color and sound equally. The trees that form the door of the inn glide forward almost imperceptibly, or seem to, to lean into, and we hold the image, saying, yes, we have seen this and left nothing behind. The myth of the wanderer is common to all cultures, the one who never quite placed harbors. To be lost is a stranger. There was no other way to arrange it, a man walking, not down the road, but beside it, who looks down, being taller than, and almost says, but not quite, and touched instead, placed his hand just barely on the top of your head. And then it turns to snow. You knew, but now can't remember what you said. Now, what through the stolen dark? And the sharp light clattered back. What star? Or he was blinded by the light coming off the snow, and the snow came off on his hands. This wander had its blindness timed. He walked into his past. Thank you. <laughs>